on several occasions, on several occasions, we've made the the uh, connection between elevation in the gravitational case and voltage in the electric case. And we're going to build on this analogy today, and that's going to help those of you that are uh, hikers. If you go hiking, you know that you want a topographical map. And that topographical map tells you where the elevation is high and where it's low. It tells you where there's a cliff, where you don't want to hike at night. It tells you where there's a saddle between two mountains. It tells you where the peak of the mountain is. And it tells you all that by just drawing lines. And each of these lines represents a certain elevation above sea level. And this line next to it is a little bit higher. And this line next to it is a little bit higher. And so when those lines are really close together, you're changing elevation very quickly in a short distance horizontally. And that's a cliff. Okay, now we're going to use that same technique to map out the electric voltage and we're going to see the same sort of a picture. Um, I'm going to show you three slides for the third time. Okay, I'm trying to brainwash you. These are the slides that I want you to see when you close your eyes at night. The first slide is just the, the operational definition of voltage, what voltage is. And it's got two definitions. The actual definition is the one at the top, okay? That's the, uh, the formal <coughs> definition. But if we remember the relationship between VERC, external VERC, and the change in energy, Verk is what changes energy. And so one way of thinking of voltage is how much I change the electric potential energy, how much I change this, when I move one coulomb from A to B. Well, I, I can't visualize that. I, I don't have a meter that tells me how much energy I'm storing. But I do have a way of measuring it. If I physically take my hand, grab that one coulomb, even though it's going to kill me, and push it from A to B, from rest to rest. Okay, I start it at rest, I move it slowly, and I stop it. In that case, there's no kinetic energy change. And that means the vert that I do, which I can very easily calculate, is the energy stored. All of my barrack is going into cocking that spring. So that makes it more visual. It's never the way it's actually done. It's just the way we imagine it being done so that we can uh, conceptualize it. Now, in practice, 99% of the time, the barrack done is zero. You're not really reaching in and grabbing a one coulomb and moving it from A to B. Typically, you're just taking an electron or a proton and you're letting it go. Kind of like letting the, the, the rock go at the top of the cliff. And what we want to know is how much does it speed up? So in practice, we use the same formula. But with this term zero. And then what we see from that is that whatever this is, this has to be the opposite. If this is plus six, this has to be minus six. And a change means is it filling or is it emptying? And so what I think of is as this bucket uh, drains, this bucket fills. It's a zero sum game. Now in the olden days when I was alive, we had TVs that were very, very fat <coughs> front to back. Okay, they, uh, they had a screen, and then it came back, and there was this part here. You've seen these all around Bozeman on the side of the street with a sign that says free. 
okay? These are old TVs. And what they did is they took a, uh, a pair of plates to accelerate electrons. And those electrons came racing forward right towards your children that were watching cartoons, just racing towards their little heads. But fortunately, those electrons hit the front of the, the back of the screen, rather, the TV screen, and lit up the screen. And it lit up the screen because the screen was covered with these little dots. There were red dots and blue dots and green dots and little triads all over the screen. And what the TV would do is just sweep these electrons back and forth, back and forth, so fast your eye couldn't see it. And everywhere it went, it either hit the red dot or the blue dot or the green dot or a combination. With those three colors, you can make any color. Now, if it was sweeping across back and forth, hitting mostly the red dots, you were watching Baywatch. Okay? <laughs> now, but that's the main problem that we always solve over and over again. We have a charge going through a voltage difference. How much does it speed up? Okay? It's the same problem as dropping a rock from the top of the cliff. How much does it speed up? by the time it gets to the bottom of the road. That's the, the problem, okay? Now, this is the third slide that you're seeing from the, for, for the third time. I want you to see the relationship between electric field and voltage, okay? Both of them are a rate. If I set the test charge equal to one, then I can see what these things mean. The electric field is the force that would act on a one coulomb. It's how much force I have for each one coulomb. If I put two coulombs there, I get twice the force. It's a rate. Likewise, the voltage is how much energy I store for each one coulomb that I take from A to B. If I take two coulombs, I store twice as much energy. It's a rate, okay, in both cases. Now, let's look at that problem that you voted off the island. You had an electron, and that electron finds itself in an electric field, and the size of the electric field was 2.5 times 10 to the fifth newtons for each coulomb. Now you take that electron and you just let it go. And it starts from rest with a curly V of zero. And when it gets one centimeter away, we want to know what's its kinetic energy. Is that problem five? Yeah. Okay, now, why did I make it go one centimeter that way when the electric field is this way? <coughs> yeah, that's this equation right here. It's an electron. If the electric field is to the right, it's that equation up there. If the electric field is to the right and it's a negative electron, the force is to the left, the negative right direction, left, okay? So this charge is going to take off to the left, and it's going to be going uh, some speed there that will give me a kinetic energy. Now, the starting point of these equation, of these problems is always this. The change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in electric potential energy with a minus sign. One's filling and one's draining. Now, if I go back to that slide, the change in kinetic energy I could just write as final minus initial. But I never really assign a value for the voltage at any one location. I, I hesitate to do that. Um, I'm always just talking about the change in voltage. And so my change in electric potential energy, this is what I really care about. This is how I find it. Okay, the Q test times the 
change in voltage. I got to bring this minus sign down, that's important. And then I've got the test charge times the change in voltage. And I make that boxy, initial to final. Now, because this particle started from rest, the initial kinetic energy is zero. Now, that's what I'm looking for. <coughs> I know it's an electron, I know what the charge on an electron is. If I knew the voltage difference it was going through, I'd be done. I just multiply that by the charge of the electron, I'd be done. Well, I've got one more tool in my box, and that is the, the change in voltage. We're told that this was a uniform electric field. In that case, the change in voltage from initial to final is the electric field times the distance from initial to final. Well, that's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the fifth, I could write that as newtons per each coulomb, but it would make more sense to write it as volts per meter, because I'm going to multiply that by 0.01 meters, and the meters will cancel. And that's going to give me a voltage difference of 2,500 volts. Okay? <coughs> now, what I just calculated was the change in voltage magnitude, okay? Without knowing which way the electron is going, uh, I don't know whether that's positive or negative, but I can figure that out. If, a, if, a, if an electron is starting out from rest and just speeding up the way it wants to go, is it going to go to higher voltage or lower voltage? Higher voltage. Yeah. Protons go downhill, electrons go uphill when we're talking about voltage as uphill or downhill. And so that means I have to have a positive change. Okay? Now here's another way of seeing it. Is kinetic energy ever negative? No, it's one half mv squared. Mass is positive, v squared is positive. This has to be positive. That minus sign and this negative charge means that this is going to be positive. So that means this had better be positive. So what I've got here is the kinetic energy final is equal to minus a minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times 2,500 volts. A volt is a joule for each coulomb. The coulombs cancel and I'm going to get an answer that's in joules, which is good if I'm looking for an energy. <coughs> okay, you see how this minus sign and this minus sign cancel each other out. Check that your neighbor understood that. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm going to build on what you did in this week's tutorial. We've all been there. Why is it positive? If I look at a region between two charged plates, positive and negative, the electric field is uniform, the field lines are parallel. And if I look at that X, and I ask you, are any of those points, A, B, C, or D, at the same voltage as the X? Well, you remember that voltage is the amount of work I have to do to get a one Coulomb test charge from one place to another place. That's the voltage difference. Well, if I go to point D or point B, I don't have to do any work. Why? because my positive charge wants to race that way. And so that means to keep it from racing that way, I've got to push this way. But I'm moving the charge, if I'm going to D, I'm moving the charge up. If I'm going to B, I'm moving the charge down. The force is this way, the displacement is that way. What kind of arc is that? Zero. Zero. Now, indeed, Anywhere along this line, 
I could move a plus one Coulomb and do zero varic. And we call that an equipotential line or surface. Now it's a line when I draw it on this screen, but if you remember that this green chunk here is a, a plate that comes out towards you with positive charge on the inside surface. This purple is a plate, a metal plate, with negative charge on the inside surface. And that means that this line really represents a surface over which I could move a 1 Coulomb test charge and I wouldn't have to do any vert to do that. Okay? Now this name, equipotential, is unfortunate. It turns out that historically, physicists have been very, very sloppy. When we talk about a voltage difference, we should say a voltage difference. But sometimes we're sloppy and we say the voltage from A to B. We mean the voltage difference, but we just are too lazy to say the word. Worse, historically, many physicists have called it potential. A potential difference, or the potential from A to B. Now that is so similar to potential energy that I find that beginning students just cannot, cannot keep those two straight. So I've been very careful with my language and everything I've written to never, ever, ever call it potential. I call it voltage. And when I'm really being careful, I call it voltage difference. Okay? Now, historically, we're stuck with this word. These are equipotential surfaces. By that we mean equal potential or equal voltage. Now, suppose I say, I just pull this number out of my left ear, that everywhere on that surface the voltage is 100 volts. Remember, I get to choose arbitrarily where my, my height is, is zero. If I were to tell you that that surface was 50 volts, and I asked you to use the Ed equation, what's the voltage on this surface? Okay? If I change my voltage minus 50 volts from here to here, the Ed equation tells me I got the same E field, same distance, I'm going to have to change my voltage by minus 50 volts from here to here. And so that means this one has to be zero volts. Now if I put a test charge there, a positive test charge there, will it feel a force there or not? Talk to your neighbor. Will it feel a force or not? Okay. Is your answer yes, no, or heck yes? Heck yes. Heck yes. Okay. Folks, zero volts, I can choose my zero anywhere, okay? This is like in the gravitational problem, looking at a rock at the bottom of the cliff and defining the height of the bottom of the cliff to be zero and asking, does the gravitational force act there? Well, yeah, the gravitational force is still acting there. I could also call my height equal to zero there and the rock would obviously have a gravitational force on it, it's speeding up there, okay? It's the electric field that causes the force, and the electric field is the same here as it is there, as it is there, as it is anywhere between the plates. And that means the force is gonna be the same here as it would be there, or there, or there. It's only the change in voltage from A to B that we ever care about. Now, if I gave you these contours, okay, equipotential lines, think of them as the contour lines on a, on a topographical map. If I asked you where is it steep, where is it shallow, you would have no problem whatsoever. Well, in the same way, we can ask where is the, gravita I'm, where is the electric field strong? Where is it weak? Well, here, my equipotential surfaces are far apart from each other. That means I have a small change in voltage per meter. Whereas here, I have a large change in voltage per meter. By the end equation, that means the E field is stronger at B. 
and it's always going to point from high voltage to low voltage. Folks, that's always true. You can take that to the bank. The electric field always <coughs> points from high voltage to low voltage. Now, if you have contours, electric field lines rather, that are not parallel, it's a little more challenging to draw these equipotential lines or surfaces. And what you have to do is draw them in such a way that they are always perpendicular to every field line they cross. Okay, so in this case, a, an equipotential line that goes through the X would have to go through B. Now, everywhere it crosses a line, I've got to have 90 degrees. And that's because if I take a 1 Coulomb test charge and I move it along that purple line, I'm always moving it perpendicular to how I would have to push on it to keep it from flying off. I would always have to push the 1 Coulomb opposite the field line, and if it's going along the purple dot dotted line, that gives me zero varic. Zero varic. Okay? So equipotential lines are always perpendicular to the electric field lines. Now here's a very important example. I have here a dipole, a positive charge and a negative charge of equal magnitude. The red lines are the electric field lines. They're born on positive charge, they die on negative charge. Born on positive charge, die on negative charge. The blue lines are the equipotential surfaces or lines, okay? And you think of those in the same way you think of a, a uh, topographical map. Now, if this were a gravity problem, what you would be looking at would be a, a mesa next to a sinkhole. Tell your neighbor which is the mesa and which is the sinkhole. Which is the mesa and which is the sinkhole? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Just like on a topographical map, a line tells me where the elevation is the same. Here, a line tells me where the voltage is the same. And the voltage is always greatest near the positive charge and always smallest near the negative charge. So this would be the mesa up here, and this would be the sinkhole, and between them you see that these field lines, I'm sorry, these contours, <laughs> equipotential lines are very close together. What that means is, well, in a gravitational <coughs> problem it would mean a cliff. Here it means a very, very strong electric field. Okay, big change in voltage for a small change in distance. Okay, do you see that? Do you see that picture? Last year at spring break, my wife and I went to southern Utah to hike with our dogs. And we found out that we could get up, if we found this special road, we could get up on top of Gooseberry Mesa, which is just spitting distance from Colorado. And up on the top of Gooseberry Mesa, there's all this petrified wood that you can harvest legally. And so we were up there gathering petrified wood for our garden, and all of a sudden these, these motor, uh, not motorbikes, but mountain bikes come racing past us, just zipping past us. And all of a sudden they screech to a halt, and the people look back, Dr. Francis? What are you doing up here? <laughs> I can't go anywhere. You people are everywhere. <laughs> uh, I go to a restaurant and I wonder what grade you got on the uh, last exam when you bring out my food. Uh, okay. Here's a picture from that old textbook that we used to buy. Uh, I found out from the book rep that now it's up to $280. Uh, and I want to show it to you because it's flawed. 
That uh, arrowhead should not be there. It should be in the middle of that. But the point that this picture is trying to make is that for a sphere, surfaces are spheres, nested spheres. And the sphere that's closest to the positive charge would be at the highest voltage. Voltage. And then they would get smaller and smaller voltage as they went further out. Okay? Now, to sum it all up, there's no work, Vert, required to move a test charge uh, perpendicular to the field lines, because I'm always pushing perpendicular to the motion. That means I'm not changing the energy if I move perpendicular to the field lines. Okay? And if I'm not changing the energy, that means I'm not changing the voltage. Because the voltage is just how much energy changes for one Coulomb test charge. We call these surfaces equipotential or equal potential or equal voltage surfaces. And the last thing is the uh, electric field will always be perpendicular to those uh, surfaces and will always point from the high voltage surface to the low voltage surface. From high to low. Just like the gravitational field is always from high elevation to low elevation. Okay? That's, that's the big idea. Now folks, we have 20 minutes and in that 20 minutes I'm going to help you work your tutorial homework that's due the Tuesday after spring break. Okay? And I want to show you that that homework has already been worked for you in the text. Okay? In the text, uh, example four and example five are very much that tutorial homework. Now, to do this, we first of all have to establish one basic principle. That if I move a one Coulomb test charge from A to B, it doesn't matter which path I take, I'm going to have to do the same amount of error. Okay? If I push it straight across from A to B, I just take the push times the distance. Well, what if instead I go like that? How much work did I just do to bring a one Coulomb test charge up there? Zero. zero. And then I have to do positive work, and then I do zero work, and then I do positive work, and then I do zero work, and I think it's easy to see that the positive work that I do here and the positive work that I do there equals the positive work that I do there. And what that means is that if I go uphill to school, I got to go downhill to come home. No matter which path I take, I can't go uphill both ways. Which means that Bill Cosby's dad was lying, and, when, and well, now we know it wasn't just Bill Cosby's dad. Yeah, I know. Hey, he was my hero. I took this hard. I mean, this is, this this just is bad. Okay, now, we have, as you saw in that tutorial, two different flavors of plates. We have plates that are hooked to a battery and plates that are insulated or isolated, where we charge them up and then we take the battery away. Let's first of all look at these insulated plates. The charge is placed on the plate somehow, usually by a battery that we take away, but it's always negative on one and positive on the other. Now if we take those plates and move them closer together, the thing that stays the same is the charge density. It can't go anywhere, okay? It's stuck. Now the charge density is what creates the electric field. So I have to have the same electric field between those two sets of plates. Now what's different is the voltage between the plates. The voltage is how much work I would have to do to take one Coulomb from plate to plate. I would have to push the same amount between both plates, but here I would have to push further. 
If I look at the Ed equation, the E field that I'm finding is the same between both sets of plates, but the distance gets smaller. So that means the total voltage gets smaller. Now, here's an analogy. Remember, voltage is VERC. VERC I have to do to bring one coulomb across. But think of it as VERC. The university comes and they say, we can't afford to keep the, the, the buildings open for 17 weeks during a semester. So we are going to shorten each semester by four weeks. Okay? And we're going to do it in such a way, we told the professors, that they cannot require more work each week. Whatever assignments they were, were giving you per week, that has to stay the same. <coughs> what does that tell you about the total amount of work that's going to get done during the semester? Less. It's going to be less. You're not going to cover all the chapters you used to cover. Okay? You're going to get cheated. Now, <laughs> let's look at the case where there's a battery connected to the plates. I told you last day that if you hook a 6-volt battery to a pair of metal plates, the voltage between the plates has to be 6 volts. Let me show you how I know that. It doesn't matter which path I take from plate to plate. So let's take this path. Let's go up through the metal. What's the electric field in this metal? Zero. Zero. And so that means I'm fighting no field. It costs me no ver. I do not change my voltage. Now to get that one coulomb through the battery, I have to do six joules of VERC on it. And that's done chemically by the battery. That's what the battery does. And then we go through the metal again, and that costs me zero. And so that means that the total VERC to get it from point A to point B was six volts, or six joules for each coulomb. And that's the voltage regardless of which path I take. Now, if I take that set of plates and I push them closer together, because of that battery, the voltage has to stay 6 volts. Come heck or high water. Now what that means is that the electric field has to get bigger. Why? Because if the voltage has to stay the same, but the distance is getting smaller, the E has to compensate. Back with the analogy. The university comes and they say, we can't keep the buildings open for 17 weeks. We're going to shorten the semester by four weeks. However, we have instructed your professors to cover just as many chapters in the book as they used to. What does that mean? You're going to be busting your butt every week that the buildings are open to get just as much done as you did before. The total, Eric, is going to stay the same. Okay? Now, that electric field is caused by surface charge. It's directly proportional. All you do is you take the surface charge divided by this number. So what does that mean? When I push these plates together, in order to keep the voltage 6 volts, what the battery does is it increases the surface charge density. What that means is it steals more electrons off of this plate and puts them onto this plate. If I took a little tiny flashlight bulb and put it in that line right there, as I was moving the plates together, that bulb would light up, okay, because electrons would be racing over there to increase the field. Now, as soon as I got it to its location and stopped the plates, the bulb would go out. When I moved the plates further apart, the electrons would go back, and the bulb would light again. I could make a light accordion with this. Just whenever I was moving the plates, it would be on. Whenever I stopped to turn around, it would go off. See if your neighbor understood that. Okay? Now, let's make the connection between that and your tutorial homework. Let's start with example five, with the insulated plates. 
In this example, we have a positive green plate and a, a negative purple plate. And we have two points labeled A and B. Now, in this example, we do a, a couple of races. The first race is with protons. We take two protons, we let one there, we put one there, and we let them go. And they race off to B. And we want to know which one's going fastest when it gets to B. The second race is with electrons. We put electrons by the negative plate, we let them go, and they race off towards the positive plate. And the question is, which one's going fastest when they get to the positive plate? Now we have this N equation, and it's so beautiful and simple that it is commonly misused. When I write the voltage is equal to the electric field times the distance, I am being sloppy. What I want to do is put labels or indices here. The voltage from point A to point B is the electric field times the distance from point A to point B. The voltage difference from the negative plate to the positive plate is going to be the electric field times the distance from the negative plate to the positive plate. If you're careful with those labels, you will not make mistakes. Let's look at these two races. Let's race the protons. <laughs> In order to speed up, you have to change your voltage. The more you change the voltage, the more you speed up. So, if I look at the proton race, I have a certain voltage difference that that proton uh, is accelerated through from A to B. It's given by E times the distance from A to B. Well, let's look at how those things change. The electric field is caused by the sigma. The sigma is stuck. The electric field is the same. And the distance from A to B is the same. But wait a minute, Greg. You said that the voltage between those plates is smaller. Listen to the words I said. The voltage between the plates, from the negative plate to the positive plate, gets smaller but not the voltage from A to B. The voltage from A to B stays the same because the electric field is the same, the distance from A to B is the same. The proton race is a tie. Now if I look at the electron race, well, it turns out that because the distance between the plates gets smaller while the electric field stays the same, the voltage between these plates would be smaller than the voltage between these plates. If I let electrons go here and here, this one would be going fastest right before it hit the plate. Okay? Now, folks, how does that change the problem? If I put a slab of metal in here where there is zero electric field inside the metal, it's exactly the same as just putting the plates closer together. In this case, we say we're going to shorten the semester by four weeks by just lopping off the last four weeks. In this case, we say we're going to make the semester shorter by four weeks by putting a four-week break in the middle of the semester and forcing you to sit on a beach and forcing you to not study. Same result, right? Same result. Okay, now let's hook up the battery and do the same two races. Again, what matters is what voltage you race through. If I look at this situation here, now it's the voltage between the plates that stays fixed by the battery. And so it's the electron race that's going to be the tie. Okay? Because I'm putting those plates closer together and demanding that the voltage between the plates stay the same, the electric field has to get bigger between the plates. 
But because this voltage is equal to that voltage, 6 volts, both electrons would be going the same speed after they went through from one plate to the other. On the other hand, when I look at the proton rays, now the distance between A and B stays the same, but the electric field is going to be bigger. So I'm going to have a bigger voltage between this A and B, and this proton is going to be going fastest when it gets to B. Now look at it this way. Let's say that's a 12 volt battery. So that means there's 12 volts from here to here. Well, that distance there is less than half the distance between the plates. So that means that this voltage here has to be less than half of 12 by the end equation. This has to be like 5 volts here. If that's 5 volts and that's 7 volts, that give me 12 volts. But over here, if this is still 12 volts from here to here, well, that's like two-thirds of the distance across. That's got to be like 8 volts from A to B. Does that make sense? Is that making sense? Okay. Now, people, um, on Friday, I'm going to be talking about capacitors. I'm going to do a demo that caused me to lose my hearing five years ago. I call it the exploding capacitor. They're going to hear it three buildings over, maybe four buildings. And um, there's going to be a lot of equipment in here. And I'm not going to have room to bring this demo back. And I don't have time to talk about it today. So I'm going to show it to you today and talk about it on Friday. I have a pinwheel here. It's got sharp little points. Okay. I'm going to mount that pinwheel, and then I'm going to dump electrons on that pinwheel with this Wimhurst machine. I'm just going to dump a whole lot of electrons on it, and watch what happens to the pinwheel. Whoa. Now, if you listen, if you're very quiet, you can hear hissing. Do you hear the hissing? Mm -hmm. That's a stream of electrons being thrown off of the points. And by third law, if the points are throwing electrons off, the electrons are pushing the points the other way, and that's what's making it go around. It's important that those points be sharp. We'll talk about that next time. Now, people, a lot of us have been getting up and leaving during this class. Uh, if you would just, everyone, vote for anything. Get some points. Okay? Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> We're going to get a lot of points. <laughs> Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> okay, and one more time. Okay, we'll see you on Friday, folks.